well. Let's still our hearts and direct our attention heavenward as the choir would lead us into worship. <clears throat> theme to that, wasn't it? You know, like a little bit of you know, crunchy thing. And there was no tambourine, unfortunately. Okay. Well, good morning. And welcome to this very special Resurrection Sunday worship. You know, I came across a, a story um, recently uh, that, like much in today's world, caused me to scratch my head a bit in dismay. It was a report about Iceland. Now, Iceland, the, the supermarket. Iceland, the supermarket, decided to produce hot cross buns with a difference. A difference, yep. Iceland decided to market and sell hot cross buns with no cross on them. With no cross on them. They took the cross off of the buns. And this was done, according to Iceland, in response to some market research that they carried out. Iceland's uh, David Lennox said this, he said, according to the research, it seems that people want to do away with the cross design. So when Iceland surveyed the public, they found that many folks wanted to get rid of the cross symbol out of their sight. They fancied the, the trimmings of Easter, in this case, the delicious bun, but without that unsightly cross thing. My friends, you cannot have Easter Sunday without Good Friday. You cannot have He is risen if the cry of it is finished is never uttered. There is no meaning or comfort to the empty grave, were it not for the occupied cross. Here's the thing. Do you know what Iceland 
replaced the cross and the bun with. Oh, Matthew's, Matthew's got it up here. See what it is? It's a tick. It's a tick. It, it's kind of like a Nike swoosh, perhaps. Now, folks, in a, in a messed up, an entirely unintentional way, those who try to hide the work of the cross from our eyes actually manage to speak a deep theological truth. You see, the empty tomb, the vacant grave clothes are actually a massive declaration of confirmation. They are, they authenticate the ministry of Christ and the acceptance of his death as an atonement for sin. God raising Jesus from the grave is saying a huge tick. Jesus is who he said he was, tick. He has accomplished that which he said he would do, tick. The Son of Man was delivered over to the Gentiles, was beaten and murdered, but three days later, as he said he would, he is risen, tick. Easter Sunday is God's confirming affirmation that the price was paid, the dead will be raised, and Christ is victorious. And we know all of this because of the tick, the mission accomplished, the empty tomb. You know, let's now join with the saints of all the ages and recite the partial greeting. I'm going to declare Christ is risen, and you may reply, he is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen Amen. Indeed. Well, let's rise to sing of this risen Lord, shall we? We're going to rise to sing, I serve a risen Savior.
lives. Let's come together in prayer to the God of resurrection and life. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Christ is risen. The world below lies desolate. Christ is risen. The spirits of evil are fallen. Christ is risen. The angels of God are rejoicing. Christ is risen. The tombs of the dead are empty. Christ is risen indeed from the dead. The first of the sleepers. Glory and power are his forever and ever. We give thanks to you, O Lord, for you have done marvelous things. When we were walking in darkness, you came to us. When we were kneeling in weakness, you leant down to lift us up. When we drew near, feeling worthless, you opened up your arms. When we were needing forgiveness, you did not turn us away. When we were searching for your grace, you opened our eyes and imparted to us faith. We give thanks to you, Lord, for you have done marvelous things. Lord, we confess that we are not often the Easter people that we should be. We do not always live in the certain knowledge of your great mercy and love. We find ourselves distracted by the world around us and we fail to hear your voice. We hide perhaps when faith is challenged and we wander off of that path. Forgive us, Lord, we pray. Restore the love that we first have and restore to us a faith that can truly endure. Lord, we will keep our eyes fixed on you, and with you at our right hand, we shall not be shaken. Lord, we pray this morning a particular blessing upon your church. We pray that we might not be shy in declaring that he has risen and the implications that it has for each and every one of us. Lord, we ask that you would still our hearts this morning, that we would truly be fixed upon you, that you would dispel from our minds all the distractions of the day and that we may fully immerse ourselves in the worship of our risen Lord. Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers this day, for we bring them in the words that the risen Lord Jesus gave his church to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, can I invite the youngsters to head off to their Sunday school classes? There we're going. I think there may be chocolate involved today because we do have with us this morning a very special guest. We have the Easter Bunny. Looking good for him. just I had a wee look around there because I think there's chocolate going on through there. I was just looking around to see if Isabel was still here. She, 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 she resisted. I thought you might sleek off there, Isabel, after the, uh, for that one. Amen. Well, uh, many, many years ago now, um, likely about 16 or so, um, I recall a preaching class at Cornhill that caused me to consider something that honestly I don't think I'd ever really noticed before. The text that I was assigned was Mark uh, chapter 16. So it was an Easter sermon. Uh, Mark 16 details a lady's glorious discovery at the empty tomb. Now, perhaps not uh, unsurprisingly, I focused on the grand declaration, He is risen. I preached about the joy of Easter, the excitement of the vacant tomb and the glorious news that Jesus, our Savior, has conquered the grave. Now that was all good and well. There's nothing wrong with that. But during the feedback session, 
the assessor asked me something that kind of took me aback. He, he drew my attention to the closing words of Mark's gospel. You see, Mark had told of the discovery and the angel's declaration to the ladies, go and tell Jesus' disciples. But then it says, and they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now the guy that was critiquing my talk, he said to me, he said, he said, what's this afraid? What's this fear? What's this trembling all about? How do we account for that? Now I'll admit to being flummoxed. I didn't know what to, to say. I mean, uh, what was it about this empty tomb? What was it about this angelic announcement that caused astonishment, trembling, and fear? I mean, isn't Easter a, a happy time? Uh, shouldn't Easter make us skip away from the tomb, not retreat in apprehension? Guys, we're going to think about this question today. The Easter message is a tale of joy. It absolutely is. But is there something in it that can draw forth a reaction of fear? Here's the bigger question. Is it the case that the journey to faith virtually must pay a visit to fear? What do you think? Okay, so let's think about the context. So Jesus had been crucified on Friday. He cried out, it is finished. And the curtain in the temple signifying separation from God was torn from top to bottom. Now notice this. The barrier between an unholy people and God's holy habitation was rent asunder, not from the bottom up, not from man to God or not by our doing. It's not that we got the, the scissors out, as it were, and by our own efforts removed the veil of separation. No, the symbolic wall was dismantled from the top down, from the heavens to the earth, from God to man, the barrier was removed. God is at work. It is he who enables communion and restoration. It's not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite? No, could my tears forever flow? All for sin could not atone. Thou must save, and thou alone. So God clears the way into his presence, and he does so by cleansing the unclean by washing the garments of his own by means of the blood of Christ on the cross. Okay. So Jesus has died on the cross, and Mark tells us that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph and Salome, were there to see it. Next, Mark records Jesus' burial. Joseph of Arimathea places Jesus' body into his own tomb. And again, the author mentions the fact that the ladies saw where he was laid. It's a point of note. These ladies saw Jesus dead and buried. There were in no doubt that the Romans had done their job, that Jesus was in fact dead. And this is where we're going to begin reading Today, from Mark chapter 16, I'll read from verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. 
He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Amen. We will end our reading there this morning. Now we're going to sing before we look at uh, this uh, pivotal chapter of the scriptures. We're going to sing together, Thine be the glory, risen conquering Lord. If you uh, were to visit uh, Scotland's capital, Old Reiki, Edinburgh, uh, amongst the excursions that you can take <laughs> is the creepily named Haunted Graveyard Tour. Now, this tour runs from the Tree of the Dead by St. Giles Cathedral, and for only £16, visitors are introduced to the spooky aspects of Edinburgh's history. 
The marketing material says people actually leave the tours because they're too scared to carry on. Hmm, okay, not sure I fancy that, but the point is this. Graveyards can be scary places. Folks, in the dawning half-light of the early morning, we read of three ladies running from a graveyard afraid. And for a few minutes today, we're going to examine their experience and place it alongside our own empty tomb discovery. You see, I'll propose in amongst the joy, the delight, the brightness, the color of Easter, there is on a human level an accompaniment of trepidation and fear. So let's get to the story. So upon finding, surprisingly, the stone in front of the tomb had been rolled away, the ladies, perhaps gingerly, popped their heads into the dark gloom of the cave-like entrance. Verse 5, entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. Now Mark uses this word alarmed twice. Luke talks about them being frightened and bowing face down to the ground. Matthew speaks of them experiencing fear. So they simply were not expecting this. They maybe took a backward step, perhaps jumped out of their skin. Seeing a man, an angel, was not what they figured they were going to witness on this Sunday morning. But here's the thing. This angel brought them good news. Do not be afraid, he says. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Okay, superb. The ladies break out into a chorus of up from the grave he arose before singing a rendition of thine be the glory, risen conquering son. Now that's what we might imagine. That's what we might perhaps be accustomed to thinking. But look at what Mark writes. They went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Look at the words, fled, trembling, astonishment, afraid. This is the question that we're going to pose, and it's the same question which faced me back in, in that preaching class. Why fear? Why fear? Well, three headings. An empty tomb causes its witnesses to fear cultural pressures. An empty tomb causes its witnesses to fear scorn from their friends. And an empty tomb brings a fearful realization that life will never be the same again. So first of all, it's likely that these ladies would be afraid of how society would treat them as bearers of this news that Jesus arose. I mean, the religious leaders in Jerusalem, along with the Roman authorities, were keen to silence Jesus. They had stood in opposition to Jesus all throughout his ministry. Mark writes that when Jesus approached Jerusalem on Palm Sunday one week ago, his followers were, that word, afraid. In chapter 14 of Mark, we read that one of Jesus' followers were seized. Peter was accosted in the square, remember, for those who sought to find out if he was part of Jesus' crowd. John 18 tells us that at his arrest, Jesus had to ask the authorities to let his friends go. Guys, the fact that Jesus' story continues brought the ladies back into the crosshairs of the culture. Jesus isn't dead. Evil hasn't won. The story of salvation goes on. And these ladies are likely afraid about what it will mean for them. Will they be persecuted? Will the soldiers come for them now? 
When the world, folks, is unable to snuff out the flame of the good news, will they just come down harder on the ones who have just been tasked to tell others about this good news? Please let me ask you something. When you came face to face with the risen Lord, when you heard the news that he has risen, did you fear cultural backlash against you if you were to act upon this news? Did you fear that your workplace might become a bit less comfy? That your friend circle might contract when you align yourself with those weird Christians? Guys, society would come down hard on these ladies and on the men that they eventually told. All the disciples, apart from John, would pay the maximum price. They would all be martyred. They would die for their faith because as Peter and John said, we cannot stop talking about what we have seen or heard. Okay, so what have you seen or heard? Well, the news that Jesus has conquered the grave. Guys, if the tomb was occupied, if the ladies walked in and anointed Jesus' lifeless corpse, Fox's book of martyrs would have been filled with blank pages. The disciples would have gone back to work, maybe married and settled down, raised 2.4 children and had a white picket fence. But no, the empty tomb caused them to become wanted men and women, folks who would turn the world upside down. So, do you blame them from fearing the response of society? Okay, so perhaps the ladies feared the, the culture's angst. Maybe they also feared the scorn of their friends. I mean, what if nobody believe them? Uh, what if they went to the disciples and the men folded their arms, shook their heads and said, what a silly bunch of ladies you are. Now we know that the testimony of a woman wasn't highly regarded back then, so it's possible that they were simply afraid that they just would not be believed. They're likely concerned that the men will label them a few sandwiches short of a picnic hamper. They're nuts. They're crazy. Imagine thinking that Jesus rose from the grave. I mean, really? Folks, when you became a Christian, when you decided to follow Jesus, when upon exposure to the folded grave crows where thy body lay, and the news that over sin he has conquered and over death victorious, did you fear the reaction of those nearest and dearest to you. Did you? I mean, it's not uncommon to receive pushback from friends and family who think you've lost your marbles. Let me read to you what one person wrote about her conversion. She said this, when I first told my Catholic-ish parents I was a born-again Christian, I caught them exchanging looks the someone is living in crazyville type looks. And she went on. She said, in this world, it is normal to give God one hour, one day a week, or just a couple of sentences, something like, I like to keep my personal beliefs private, or I, I believe in God, but I don't make a big deal out of it. She said, but many people consider you weird if you talk about your beliefs outside of church, or you love to study the Bible, or you love to share the gospel, end quote. Guys, when somebody gets serious about Jesus, the very people who are closest to them may feel out of sorts. They'll be fine if you can keep it to an hour on a Sunday, and even then, only if it doesn't clash with any plans that they have. But the moment Jesus starts to exercise real influence, the moment you say no to something that's on their agenda, aren't you taking this a bit too far? You've lost the plot. So let's recap. The ladies were lightly afraid because they knew the cultural pressure that would come down on them. And they were also lightly afraid of being called crazy or disbelieved by those close to them. Here's something else. These ladies were afraid 
Because now, everything changes. Their lives will never be the same again. The empty tomb upended their life. It declared it was true. Jesus is who he said he was. The miracles were not fragments of our imagination. Jesus was not a trickster, was not an imposter, was not a charlatan. No, the guy who kept on telling us that he would die and rise, well, he pulled it off. And you know what this means? It means that everything else he said when he walked this earth in our hearing must also be true. The bits about God caring for you, about forgiving neighbors and loving enemies, this thing about picking up your cross and dying to self, about loving others more than you love yourself. All this needs to be reckoned with now. Guys, the precious invitation to eternal life and yes, the dire warning of eternal punishment has been authenticated by this graveyard encounter. Folks, it's like this. Meeting Jesus, seeing Christ for who he is, will be a scary prospect because it's a game changer. Somebody wrote this. There is still fear manifested in the hearts of lost men when they realize there is more to this Jesus than they thought. And if their fear brings them to Christ, then it's not a bad thing. You see, this is what I'm proposing today. I'm thinking that fear over the implications of the empty tomb, fear that because he lives, my life will be absolutely altered and recentered. I think that fear is natural. Indeed, perhaps knowing this fear for a time, for a season, is simply part of the process of becoming a Christian. Like the man who Jesus told to consider the cost of following, the empty tomb causes us to make a decision on where we go next with this fear. Will it arrive at faith or will it be forgotten? You see, the ladies could have blanked out of their mind what they just saw. They could have had a wee meeting whereby they conclude, let's just pretend this This didn't happen. And this is the cautionary aspect of Easter. For Matthew, and his account tells us of what happened shortly before these ladies showed up. And it also involves a fearful response. Listen to this, Matthew chapter 28, verse 2. It says, There was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. The guards were terrified. They were afraid also. But, but, you know how they dealt with it? These guys accepted a bribe. They took money to pretend it didn't happen. They were at the tomb that day, but the circumstances of life, maybe they thought that they would be executed for letting this happen. They'd be ridiculed by their pals, and their life would necessarily change. It caused them to look the other way, to leave the empty tomb behind them, and to carry on with life regardless, unchanged and unsaved. And this is a challenge that faces each of us when we are confronted with the Easter story. Will fear turn to faith and become manifest in following? Or is it as you were? Don't think about it too much. It would be a bit scary to linger in this (coughs) graveyard for very long. Guys, the ladies moved from fear 
to fearlessness. They realized that if Jesus' grave is vacated, then in time my grave also will be likewise empty. You know, back at the start, I referenced the, the spooky graveyards of Edinburgh. Now, if you know your history, you will be aware that in the Victorian era, Scotland's capital it gained quite a, a dark reputation for being a place where grave robbing was common. Remember that? Grave robbing, you know that? You heard of Burke and Hare and all that, yeah? Anyhow, because of a surge in anatomical studies in the university system, Edinburgh's cemeteries became profitable for thieves who would rob the bodies at the graves. They would steal the dead out of their graves. And these grave robbers who were given a nickname, do you know what it was? They were called resurrection men. Resurrection men. Guys, the original grave robber, the first resurrection man, the one who empties tombs, not temporarily, but into eternity, is God. He emptied the tomb of Christ, and you know what? He promises to release you and I from the clutches of death and the grave if we put our trust in him. In the last few weeks, I've been listening to this song by a, a contemporary Christian artist. The guy's named Crowder, okay? And the song is called, you ready for it? Grave Robber. The song's called Grave Robber. Listen to what he says. He says this. I used to live like a rebel, didn't want to behave. Thought a wretch like me could never be saved. But everything changed, I remember the day when I heard him calling my name. Like a thief in the night, he snuck in, took my life. I was dead, now I'm alive and singing. And listen to the, the chorus, it says, I got stolen by the grave robber, picked me up from that rock bottom, washed my soul in that holy water, brought me back to life. One more stone rolled away, one more sinner been saved by grace. This dead man, he ain't dead no longer, all because of that grave robber. Guys, has the grave robber brought you back to life? Have you moved from fear to faith to following him? You know, I read recently a story about this native tribe in South America, and the people in the tribe had been dying, dying young for years and years. And they were scared, and they, and they didn't know why they were dying. And they called in a, a university who sent some students over to investigate. And after investigation, the cause of the premature death was found. The disease was transmitted by an insect that lived in the walls of their homes. Now, armed with this knowledge, the village had two options. They could move to another area... Uh, where away from the insect they, they could be, or, or they could tear down their homes and rebuild them with material that the insects couldn't live in, or they, they could just continue as you were and just die early. Now, surprisingly, these folks, they opted to remain and just die early. They stayed. They stayed unchanged and rejected that which would have brought them a fuller experience of life. Friends, this Easter Sunday, as we peer with the ladies into the empty tomb, as we hear the angel tell us he has risen, how will we react to this news? Fear? Faith? Following? Or fear? Forgetfulness? Or fatality? Beloved, these ladies, you know what? They didn't stay afraid. Matthew says they departed from the tomb with fear and with great joy. Beloved, I pray that you're joyful this morning. And you know why you should be joyful? Because at some point, you've stopped off at fear. And you've moved from that fear.
Let's pray, shall we? Lord God, we are confronted by this game changer, this news that death is not the end, this authentication that Jesus Christ is the Son of God that he said he was, that he did the impossible that he said he could do, and that, Lord, you have made promises to your people of further impossible things. You have promised eternal life to all who would believe and receive. You have promised a mansion in heaven to all who come to you in faith. Lord, we pray for those amongst us this morning who have not yet extended their hand to you. We pray for those who are perhaps looking fearfully at the options before them. They perhaps know that life will never be the same again. They perhaps understand that they might feel pressure from the culture or indeed from their friends and family if they were to declare themselves to be yours, if they were to nail their colors to the mast. But Lord, the promises that you make are not insignificant and can be refused. The promises that you make are glorious and last into eternity. So Lord, we pray by the regenerating power of your Holy Spirit, you would move even now. The hard parts would be made open. The ears would hear this wonderful declaration and be changed. The lives, as they leave here today, would never be the same again. Lord, move in this place, we pray. For Jesus' sakes. Amen. Amen. Well, we shall sing uh, <clears throat> once more as we close. We're going to sing, Jesus Christ is risen today.
well. <clears throat> Just a few notices. No evening service uh, tonight. Uh, no evening service tonight. Wait, are you guys on Tuesday night now? No? No? Okay. A uh, midweek meeting Wednesday at 7 p.m. Mid oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. Midweek meeting Wednesday at 7 p.m. And next Sunday, I'm on holiday on Thursday. Next Sunday, Bobby will be preaching. Uh, so do pray for him. It's communion Sunday as well. So there will be teas and